But uh, right now we have our guest uh, on the air, and I want to introduce him. Uh, Clint Stutz has pulled together a group down here in Texas who have worked on the notification of Obamacare bill, or what I like to say, Obama doesn't care. Uh, and Clint is a grassroots activist. He's um, active in, I believe, We Texans and several other groups around the area. Uh, and he also is a business owner of Go-Kart Galaxy. So for those of you Go-Kart owners out there, if you need parts, uh, free Go-Kart, that's the site to go to. And um, let's just go ahead and bring Clint on. Clint, how's it going this evening? Oh, pretty good, James. Pretty good. Well, why don't you tell us uh, how you came about um, your interest in this bill and uh, where it's at? Well, it's uh, kind of a long story, but I'll try to truncate it a little bit. Um, I was very involved in the the Texas uh, Republican Convention this last go round, organizing for that beforehand. You know, we we spent two or three or four months, you know, trying to get the right people to show up so we can make a positive change in the in the Texas Re- Republican Party, and we did have uh, some measure of success. And after that effort, I was completely burned out because not only was I doing that, but at the same time, I was campaigning hard for a guy named T.J. Fabby uh, in uh, House District 10. We were trying to unseat a 20-year incumbent, and we failed, but uh, it was a valiant effort. But uh, we worked our butts off on that campaign and at the same time tried to gear up for the state convention. So by the time the convention was over, I was completely burned out. I didn't want to think about politics or reading anything political, Um, so that meant staying off Facebook, of course, but... um, so I vowed right after the convention, which was uh, – I think it was the beginning part of June. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm not going to do anything political until after the November election. I'm through. I'm sick of this. I, I quit. A month <laughs> later. <laughs> a month later. I you held um, out for four weeks. <laughs> yeah, four whole weeks. And uh, what, what happened was – see, I, I was the program director for the Cedar Creek Lake um, Tea Party, and – I was so burned out. I was just kind of, you know, like, oh, man, I don't want to do anything, but I have to come up with a program for this this month's meeting. And so I thought, well, you know what? Obamacare is going to rear its ugly head in a big way come 2013. Why don't we try uh, to get something going on nullification of Obamacare? And I was uh, a big nullification proponent during um, Deborah Medina's campaign for governor back in 2010. I mean, that was the cornerstone of her campaign was nullification in her position. And that that was the answer to federal tyranny. So I thought, okay, well, let me uh, just go to the Tenth Amendment Center's website. And you know, I, I knew they had a, you know, just a boilerplate bill that that was always up there you could print out. Yeah, I saw and, it coming uh, for us. Yeah, and uh, I thought, you know, the boilerplate bill was enough to do what we wanted to do. And uh, a couple of weeks later, after I had already gotten this thing started, I was like, well, wait a second. If you read closer, it really doesn't do anything. It doesn't establish policy. It just says it's nullified in Texas, and if someone tries to enforce it, there's penalties. So essentially, uh, it essentially the the Buller, uh plate bill was a glorified resolution, wouldn't you say? I mean, it was like the legislature, if uh, a legislature that would have passed it, essentially was saying, yeah, it's nullified here, but what does that mean? How does it play out? How do we yeah. protect the people? It, it didn't give any details, and I think they leave it that way on the Tenth Amendment Center's website because they can't tailor a bill for each state. They, they probably mean that to be a starting point for you. But what has played out is that all these states that have either passed or introduced um, nullification of Obamacare legislation, it's, it's been something that is either – Word for word, what their their bill was, or they've changed a little bit here and there, but not much. But nobody's added any policy to actually fight against the provisions of Obamacare. I mean, you can okay. say it's null and void all you want, but you have to have a policy in place that actually interposes against Obamacare. So, so you have to have something that you're actually arguing about, other than just saying no. Yeah, you can. You got to say no, and you say. You say, no, and here's what we're going to do in response to what you're doing. 
So tell us about the teeth of, of your bill. Or at least the, the teeth of our teeth. bill. Now let let me preface this by by saying that we and James, you were a part of this group. Yes. <laughs> uh, there was about I want to say about seven or eight of us that were consistently on these conference calls every uh, Sunday night for what three or four months? You think? Yeah, um, about that. We spent sometimes an hour, hour and a half on a Sunday night on a conference call trying to figure out what in the world we could do, what kind of policy we could come up with that would interpose against Obamacare. And it became pretty apparent to us early on that it was going to be really hard. And what we finally came up with was something that was going to interpose against the taxing portion of Obamacare. There's a lot that Obamacare does, but there's only so much that we can actually formulate a policy against at this point because the states have been so neutered over the decades that the federal government is so intertwined in our business that we can't even begin to interpose against some portions of it. So we chose the taxing portion because we did see a way out in, in that. And the policy we established in our bill when we turned it in uh, to be to, to be written and drafted by the Legislative Council here in Texas was to force the IRS to go through the Secretary of State's office whenever they pursue someone for not paying uh, a federal income tax. And the, the thought process behind that is this. When you don't pay a federal income tax and the IRS sends you nasty letters, they'll send you a few letters, then they'll start coming after you. They'll try to file a lien. And a lien has to go through some office or agency in Texas. And the uh, in Chapter 14 of the Texas Property Code, it actually tells the IRS how they have to file a lien in Texas. And it's actually, I'll read the title of the, the chapter. It says, Uniform Federal Lien Registration Act. It tells them what they have to do and where they have to go to register a lien. And unless they go through that process, it's not a registered lien, and it does not count against the taxpayer. And uh, what we thought we would do is, number one, amend Chapter 14 to add some more teeth in there to say, well, if you don't follow these procedures, then your lien is null and void. And the procedure is, if, 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 a, if a taxpayer, let's say, James, that you – file your taxes in 2013, and you owe X amount of dollars for Obamacare taxes, let's say $1,000 just for the heck of it. Your total tax bill that year was $2,000. So you, you say, okay, well, I'm not going to pay 1000 of it. I'm just going to send them a check for $1,000. Well, you get the nasty letters from the IRS, and they start pursuing you, and they finally get to the point where they're going to file a lien. Well, they have to follow our law in Texas regarding how you register a lien. And our bill says, well, James didn't pay $1,000 of his Obamacare taxes. So the IRS comes to the Secretary of State and says, we're, we're trying to pursue this person for this tax, and um, we're seeking your approval per your law. Secretary of State says, well, we nullified Obamacare in Texas. If you're trying to collect Obamacare taxes, you're out of luck. And if you're trying to collect anything else that is a lawful tax, we'll let you collect that, but if it's if it's related to Obamacare, you're out of luck. So if they get denied by the Secretary of State, at that point, they don't have authorization to go file a lien anywhere in Texas. And if they try to sidestep that process, they are liable, or they are criminally liable uh, for uh, for circumventing our law. And that's where the uh, the Class B misdemeanor comes in, and, and jail time, and a fine. So it's it's basically a blocking mechanism. And, and though, and, and I'm sorry, I um, I had some technical difficulties and uh, got disconnected, so I missed part of what you had said. Um, but uh, if I remember right, we did also draft a method for the government to um, go through in order to have legal access to uh, recovery of unpaid taxes that were not um, related to uh, Obama doesn't care. True? Yeah, if if the taxes that the IRS is trying to pursue the, the taxpayer for are lawful taxes, uh, 
they will be allowed to file a lien for those and file levies uh, and execute levies up to the amount of those taxes owed, but nothing related to Obamacare will be allowed to be collected in Texas. Yeah. Um, so we kind of felt it important to really isolate the Obamacare or Obama doesn't care, but you know, yet we did realize that we couldn't, uh, as much as many of us would have probably have loved to, uh, told the IRS you've got to keep your uh, hands off everything. Um, the reality is, is you know, uh, pay unto Caesar what is what is his, and we kind of took that approach. And we actually had several different approaches, some not so uh, constitutional by someone that kind of thinks of themselves as more constitutional. Um, you want to discuss a little bit of those challenges we had reining everyone in? And that particular person I'm referring to is me. It was pointed well, out that uh, one of my me ideas. Too, though. Yeah. <laughs> My initial idea was unconstitutional. I was so heartbroken because I realized it, and it was obvious, but it just kind of flew over my head at the time. But um, I'll let you explain your idea because I've forgotten half of it, and then I'll explain mine that was unconstitutional. So you go ahead first. The gist of my idea was that um, all funds would route through the uh, state treasury before being paid to the federal government. And um, there was a little bit more in my concept besides Obamacare, but um, essentially it would just be routed through the state and what was justly due the uh, the feds would go directly to the feds. But if there was something uh, that was for Obamacare, that would be set aside. It wouldn't be paid to the feds. It would eventually get routed back to the citizen um, and, and it would be protected but it would be shown in that transfer. And part of my thought was for other areas of what we pay the federal government is let's say we decided we were going to turn down uh, the educational money that we uh, receive or other funds, and therefore we were going to take this on as a state. Well, that percentage of that tax ultimately really shouldn't go to the government because we're not paying uh, we're not receiving the educational funds, and why should we pay into it? Um, however, uh, the government, uh, the Congress, is uh, does have the right to uh, to collect taxes, uh, to you know require and collect taxes, and we would have been directly in violation of the Constitution and that right, even if it was for a what we believe to be an unconstitutional. Um, tax, and that's pretty much the the same plan that I I, I think I had latched on to yours, and I was so excited, and then Tom Glass burst our bubble. Uh, I, I think I actually missed that conference call that night, but I listened to the recording. And I was like, oh no, Tom's right. We can't do that. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you're so right. One of the things I, I loved about the environment in which this bill was drafted, and I kind of got less involved the further on it went. I just got busy in life, was we had, I think it was more like 14 people at one time or another uh, giving input to this bill. So it wasn't just any one person except you that took the, uh, took the lead. Um, it wasn't just any one person voicing in, and um, it really, I think, went to epitomize what good legislation or how good legislation is supposed to come about. It's not just one person saying, I'm going to pass this law, but it's discussion, it's debate, it's tearing apart ideas, and all of which we did. And, you know, even though, like my idea, Tom came and said, well, that's unconstitutional, and it was blatantly obvious to him, I guess I was so um, – enamored with my bill, maybe, for lack of a better word, that, uh, you know, I never saw it from the point that was bl was so obvious as soon as he mentioned it. Yeah, and uh, I think early on we we did have people like like 14 or 16 people on, and then it kind of dwindled down to the, the you know, seven or eight that would consistently show up for it, and we had great discussions, and we hammered out a plan, the first plan, that was actually constitutional, was the one we set up where we, we were going to make um, uh, county adjudication boards that would kind of work like the, 
the property tax appraisal board in your county where you would go and uh, the IRS would have to come there to collect whatever taxes that they say you owe them, but the adjudication board would say, oh, wait, this is an Obamacare tax. You can't collect this. Mm -hmm. And so that was our idea up, into a, up to a point. And then we had one conference call where we had a bunch of folks up in the, uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex area get on because uh, I had gone to speak at the, uh, the, the, nine, the Fort Worth 912 um, group up there. I had a, a speech on nullification up there. They got really riled up and all excited. And that next conference call, we had probably 40 or 45 people on the line. And out of that group, after that whole conversation was, was over, that took about two hours, I think, about four or five or six of those new people that were on the line, they wanted to get together and discuss our plan further in the middle of that, of, of that next week. And one of those people was a guy named Barry Schleck. He's an activist up there in the, in the Metroplex area. Uh, Pastor St Stephen Broden, who ran against, um, I forget what her name was up there in, in that area. He ran for Congress and lost, unfortunately. Um, and Robert and Ross Kessig, they were on, the, on this call with us. And Barry was the one that said, well, why do we have to do this county adjudication board? seems like a lot of bureaucracy. When all we really well, I was laughing about that because – I was thinking the same thing, but Tom had some great reason for it. I think because, you know, partially thinking that the county is your smallest, largest uh, yeah. government. But anyway, so go on. <laughs> and you know, I got on that call with the, with those few guys that that evening, thinking, well, I need to, I need to defend our bill because we worked hard on this, and and I'm proud of what we've done. It may not be perfect, but it's a, I think it's a good bill. So. We'd spend all this time on that, and Barry gets up and says, I don't think we have to have this county adjudication board. This is really all just a paperwork thing, isn't it? And I, I wanted to protest for a second, but and, and there was kind of an awkward silence on the phone while I was thinking this through. And I was like, oh, yeah, I think we should think about this some more. I think you have a point, Barry. And before that call was over, I was I was convinced that Barry was correct, that it was simply a paperwork thing that could be taken care of at the Secretary of State's office. It's like mm -hmm. they just check a few boxes and, you know, okay, IRS, you can't do this or you can do this, and and uh, that's all it was. So, oh, and, and if I remember right, um, the IRS would still have to prove they have, you know, any citizen is innocent until proven guilty. So that same concept comes to play here is the IRS would have to prove that the taxes that they are attempting to collect are, in fact, owed and are not related to Obama doesn't care. Yes. They would have to actually itemize each tax owed and the amount owed. Otherwise, I mean, there's, there's no go. They can't, can't pass go, can't collect $200, you know. Um, so that detail is in there, and um, it was really refreshing because <laughs> we had our group of eight people for so long, and we we got we we got tunnel vision, I think, and we yeah. did good work. We did great work. We came up with a with most of that plan that was workable, and mm -hmm. then a few few guys from one particular area, one one says, "Hey, what about this?" and the whole thing changes. That, that's what the grassroots is all about, man. You listen to each other. You don't bite each other's heads off. You listen. You gather information from each other, and you come up with the best plan. And I've never met probably half these people in person. Um, I've met uh, Teresa. I've met you. I've met Daniel. But the rest of the folks, I think I met Tom. I met Tom. But the rest yeah. of the folks that we've been on the phone with, I've never met in person ever, and probably won't unless we meet down in Austin for some kind of protest or something. <laughs> but well, you made a you made an excellent point. Uh, you know, the grassroots compared to so many other organizations, you're absolutely right. It's not about uh, biting anybody's heads off. And it's all about, you know, we're all a collective group here. And um, first of all, I want to say I'm very honored to have you on the show tonight. So thank you for coming on. Well, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, I just, I look at it this way, you know, I'm all of us, have all gotten involved, whereas four or five years ago, did we ever think that we would be as involved and caring citizens 
uh, fighting to take back this country and doing the things that we are doing. And the greatest thing is that the grassroots effort that is what is bringing out the real patriots in this country, the doers, the ones that are staying off of just, as I always say, uh, you know, you can you can be as mad as you want and do all the posting on Facebook, but so many of those are the like-minded, and we're trying to reach those that typically, and that's the goal of this show, is reaching those that typically don't tune in, the silent majority, those that are on the fence, those that don't typically listen to conservative radio. That's why this is a different show, a different voice, and trying to, uh, you know, we're this is an international show. Uh, we have those across the pond that listen on a regular basis, that post for us and spread the word. As a matter of fact, uh, one of my very close and dear friends sent a message on my Facebook page Speaking uh, directly about when we were talking earlier today about immigration, you know, Obamacare, uh, I have been trying to get people to understand. We were just talking about this last night with the gentleman that I'm out here in Colorado with. You know, when when I tried to get people to understand what the anointed health care plan meant, back four years ago when unemployment was still very high, people were losing their benefits, to them, government-run health care seemed like a great idea because it was more than what they had and it seemed better than what they were dealing with because the health care system is broken to begin with. It's, 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 well, it's just, and it needs, to be, it needs to be taken apart and it needs a fix. However, having our current administration, and I always say, it's bankrupt to begin with. And I'm up in North Dakota. We're fighting it very, very hard. And I I just don't even see how they're going to even implement it when they don't even have the money behind it. And it is really, at this point, right now, it's just a revenue generator through taxation. Yeah, and you're bringing up the, the money side of it, and that's kind of the point. Not only was the taxation the only thing we could really attack with a policy – it was the best thing to attack because it starves the beast. And yep. if our bill is in any way successful, and I, I really don't know what kind of chance it has in this legislature. Uh, the Texas legislature only meets once every two years for 140 days, and I don't know if we're going to get it this time. Um, but I do know that the, the representative that's, that's carrying the bill right now, he is fully committed to it, and if it doesn't get past this session, he is not giving up. I mean, number one, we're going to have a bill that we can use next time. Number two, he might try a different strategy for getting it passed. There's sometimes you have to break up a bill into several bills and pass them, you know, separately to get what you want. And he's uh, he's the kind of guy that's not going to give up, and he will pursue this because he knows that, you know, these are unprecedented times. Yes, the they are. Government has has grown so large and has usurped so much power that the states have to fight back and take their rightful place as the master of the federal government. We created the federal government. It's not the other way around. I mean, 13 colonies or states ratified the Constitution and created a limited federal government with few delegated powers, and that's it. And the and rest those of powers it were clearly the states and the people. They were clearly Reagan, defined and even strengthened with the uh, the Bill of Rights, which are not yes. limiting the people, but it is limiting the, the federal government. Exactly. And, and when somebody who doesn't know anything about uh, nullification asks me about it and, and says, well, what is it? I just say it's the fulfillment of the Tenth Amendment. Because if you read the Tenth Amendment, it's pretty straightforward. It either, it either means what it says or it doesn't. The federal government is delegated certain few powers. And then the Tenth Amendment says that whatever is not delegated to the federal government and not prohibited to the states is reserved to the states or to the people. It's very straightforward. And, and that would be case. that would be great if we had a, a, an administration in place that uh, that adhered to the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. But you know, we all know that the Constitution, in their eyes, is an old document that's to be dismissed, and it's it's being. Uh, you know, it's being assaulted 
uh, on a on a regular basis. That's what makes this administration so dangerous. Well, and and we, that's why your that, that's why your state legislatures are so important. That is, the, the state legislature is a lot easier to lobby than the national. Uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate. It's so much easier because it's right there in your state, and you have a better chance of knowing your rep- – I, I know two representatives personally, and you can't hardly say that about you know national congressmen well, yeah, or senators. I mean, and just getting a word rep, in with them is impossible. Your state reps, and, even in a state like Texas, uh, are so easy to access. I mean, I've been yeah. here a year and a half. I've probably met – close to 2025 and I haven't really tried to um, you know they are accessible they are reachable and you know Clint we started a new section talking about uh, 33 questions in American history you're not supposed to ask we're going to tie back in a few minutes so Bella you know we started talking about the founding fathers and immigration and I probably need to clarify um, that we're talking about legal immigration. The Founding Fathers never supported the illegal entry into a foreign country except as an act of war, more commonly referred to as an invasion. Um, Some of the Founding Fathers, Benjamin Franklin, uh, often said some rather politically incorrect statements by today's standards, and here's just one. Uh, Why should Pennsylvania, founded by England, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglifying them, and will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion. You know, essentially, he was saying that immigration of sufficient numbers and concentration could radically change the culture in ways that the Americans uh, might not want, and, and this would happen in in any country. Um, Franklin was also not alone. Thomas Jefferson warned about the mass immigration in his notes on Virginia, and I'm sure uh, this may be a surprise to to some listeners. Um, are there no inconveniences to be thrown into the scale against the advantage expected by multiplication of numbers by importation of foreigners? It is the happiness of those united in society to harmonize as much as possible in matters which they must, of necessity, transact together. Essentially, Jefferson feared that foreigners would bring with them principles of governments that they left, Um, you know, kind of like how Californians are commonly thought of today. They come into different states with their money, and they purchase their summer or winter homes, and eventually they want those um, California ways to become ways of rural Montana or North Dakota or wherever they're at. Well, and that's so. what that was what my point was when I said and I'm going to pull both uh amnesty and Obamacare together. What you know, what I had said was that I I don't none of us oppose legal immigration. And back in the day when those that immigrated to this country, they were coming here for the American dream. They were coming here for what America represented to the rest of the world, which is when we had the American dream, when you could come here and you could do what only exists in very small areas of this country right now because the American dream has been has been squashed because entrepreneurialism and capitalism is a bad word. It is a negative connotation. You are not supposed to be a capitalist. You are not to be an entrepreneurial because you will be taxed to death. And that is not the American dream uh, built by the administration. They talk about it, but they don't support it. And when you take amnesty, which it, it is, you know, now the immigrants come to this country with the entitlement. They believe that they are entitled to certain rights that they are given by the current administration because that builds the voter base. And Obamacare is nothing more than something created to then take care of the entitlement society. And if you look at it, it is not a health care bill. For the love of God, you can get a sex change that is supposed to be paid for by us taxpaying individuals. And this is that's why the lunacy and the madness of this whole administration 
from from day one and to where we are today with uh, three years and ten months left of uh, this. Uh, I just it's insanity of what they are shoving down the forty seven percent of the hardworking tax paying individuals that have to support the fifty three percent of the entitlements and if people take the time and I've said this now the the what's going to happen now because when you tried to explain to people what was going to happen now it's hitting their paycheck. Mm-hmm. Now they're being asked the questions when they're going into their doctor about if they own arms. Uh, they're seeing the taxes coming out of their paychecks. They are now seeing uh, the the beginning of the effects of where Obamacare is starting to at least the questions are being asked. You know, start asking your doctors the impact. Start asking them how they see it, how many people are going to leave the private practice. Ask those that are directly affected, the, those that are up in into the ages where they have serious life-threatening things that they have to be taken care of, you know, cancer and other very serious uh, life-threatening illnesses that they are facing. I gave I give the perfect example of something as basic as bronchitis, which I get twice a year. It's especially worse now that I'm breathing all the scorio dust out in the oil fields. And, you know, the hoops that you're going to have to jump through, the time that it'll take you to get in I mean, it's just, it's, it is just, it is something that is so mind boggling when you actually get into the bill and you read all of the different, I mean, it is not a healthcare plan. It is designed to, uh, weed out really the population. And I, I just sit back and I look at the reality of it. It's bankrupt to begin with. We don't have the money to support it. And no, we don't. We don't. And really, what has this administration it been able to really accomplish the only thing the only things that this administration has been able to accomplish is on a daily basis oh, 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 oh. Oh, i know uh-huh. i know he got a weekend away from the press while he could golf with tiger woods that's what the administration did <laughs> well they what they did accomplish is spending and spending and spending and spending and they continue to spend money that we don't have they continue spending money we don't have. And I see that there are so many on a daily basis. First of all, I encourage people to look at look at the positives. What what has this administration done for the country is every single time they threaten to take our arms, we go out and we buy more guns. We are we have more guns and more ammo than they even suspect that we have. We are poised for position. And you know, I just see that Every single week, every single month, as it keeps going forward, the more that they threaten to take away from us, I just believe that at some point we're going to stand up and we're going to say we're not going to take it anymore. And God love you, Texas, because from Texas all the way up to North Dakota, as people on the other coast that don't have the arms, you know, they live in the very strong liberal states. It's very bleak and it's very discouraging for them. But one of my strongest uh, supporters is Texas. Uh, being that I'm up in the oil fields in the Bakken, and and I don't know if you know that, that that's well, where I am, yeah. but um, Clint, that's where I'm at every day is out talking to, and the majority of the guys are from the south, and uh, you know you are, you know I would not want to cross someone from Texas because you don't like to lose. And you are absolutely right. We have to go after the local officials. That's that's the only ones that we can affect right now because uh, when you look at the anointed's track record, unfortunately he has shoved through everything that he said he was going to do. I just do not see how the anointed health care plan will actually get implemented because that is one of the, uh, it, you know, it's one thing to pass a bill. It's another thing to actually fully implement it when when there's not a dollar behind it and when over 70% of the country didn't want it. Well, well first you know, they have to actually read the bill to understand what they're actually implementing. Mm-hmm. Well, they had to pass it first. <laughs> you got to remember, they had to pass it first. We're on the air with Clint Stutz, um, who's talking about the nullif- Texas nullification of Obama doesn't care bill. Um, the website that uh, they have is texasnullification.org. Clint, go ahead, pick it up. Tell us a little bit more of, of the momentum and how you put this together. 
And before, Clint, you take over, hang on one second, because James, as I, I said, uh, and Clint, uh, I'm sorry, but I've, I'm have i out of town tonight. I'm, I'm down in Colorado doing some, some business things and haven't been able to have the regular show schedule. But James and Clint, you guys are going to take it from here. Um, I have to I have to bow out because of some other obligations. But, uh, again, I'm honored to have you on, Clint, if you'd like to come on the show again. And please spread. Tell everybody. Tell all of your connections down there, you know, if you'd like to have an evening just to get, dedicate to talking. I mean, I, the more that we can get out there, the more that we can get people to understand and, and fully understand just what a – I mean, it, it, I it, I don't even know the words to describe the the most horrific, the most abominable bill that ever went through, unread, shoved it through because it's really about voter base and so many other nefarious things that we can't even imagine an administration, and that's why so many people could not fathom that our own administration, our elect, elected officials, would actually put something through that is this detrimental this crippling and the biggest thing the first thing that it did was it halted our economic recovery because before it even was passed the big ceos cfos in manufacturing in our economy they sat back and they said i can't afford to spend any of my money because they didn't know how much it was going to cost then when they started getting an idea of how much it cost, then the next thing that they had to do is they had to scale back and go below 30 hours to try and keep the cost at bay. Now, the next dangerous piece that's coming in, and enough people do not understand, but I come from manufacturing background. I spent 15 years in manufacturing back in Minneapolis. And I spent 15 years, first of all, in in garages and machine shops. Then I went into food manufacturing, medical manufacturing, any type of manufacturing you could you could uh, you could envision. In Minneapolis, I had the whole territory, and I did temporary staffing. And I know that 90% of manufacturing has temporary employees in place to run their manufacturing floors, and in Chicago as well. Dangerously in Chicago, the wage is even lower. And below minimum wage, and first of all, raising minimum wage to $9 an hour is is ludicrous. But anyways, the dangerous part about amnesty is that, first of all, manufacturing is halted because of the cost of the anointed's health care plan. And then when amnesty is passed, what that will force, manufacturing to do is it's going to take the rest of our uh, our individuals that are making those good wages from anywhere from 10 upwards to 18 20 dollars an hour it's going to displace those workers think about what happened when the illegal immigrants came in and took over construction primarily the hispanic culture when they came in and they undercut and i know this very very well majority of my friends back in minneapolis were making the great wages until the illegal hispanic culture came in came in and it forced contractors to undercut underbid take that workforce displace those workers and guess what when those contractors wanted to come back in anywhere from cement to to the construction they had to come in and compete at those lower wages well, that's what's going to happen in manufacturing because when amnesty is passed, now what's going to happen is those companies, if they want to stay here in the States instead of shipping and shoring offshore, which, trust me, I know they didn't want to do it, but I sat in those board meetings when anywhere from Turk to Cypress Semiconductor, Boston Scientific, uh, uh, 3M, I can go on and on and list the companies that had to offshore. Well, now the ones that stayed in order for them to cover the cost of health care, they will displace those workers and they will put those now legal to be illegal in those positions so they they can make their bottom line. And now those people that lost their jobs, now think of what it's going to do to unemployment. This is at a time when unemployment is at a record high and they're going to flood the workforce with illegals that are now legal that will take the lower wages. So now those 
young men and women, all of those men and women doing those jobs will have to come back, and if they want their jobs back, instead of making 18 bucks an hour, now it's more like $8 an hour. At a time when the cost of living and hyperinflation is just around the corner. It's insanity, but it's a purposeful dismantling. And that's why, as I sit here every night, you know, tonight I'm sitting in my hotel room. Tomorrow night I'll be back in either Studio A, which, Clint, I don't know if you've, you've heard this, but my studio is many times in my three to, three-quarter ton diesel pickup truck sitting outside my camper in the oil fields in Williston. Depending on how cold it is, though, then I end up in my camper because the diesel, the, the motor's a little too loud and I don't want to talk over it. But I'm dedicated every night and I'm relentless in my pursuit and we're gaining momentum and we're gaining ground and we got one more listener tonight and I will stop being so long-winded because I have to get out and fulfill my other commitments. But uh, spread the word and spread the message. Get one more person to tune in because we're going for a larger audience and Clint, you're going to help us get there, and I'm honored again that you came on, and if you'd like to come on again, we'd love to have you, and I'm going to bow out, gentlemen, so take it from here, and we will, will be back I, uh, on, <laughs> and, and I'll be back on tomorrow night, because uh, James, real quick, give the give a, a plug for the guest that's on tomorrow night with, uh, with Mendingo and I. <laughs> Alex Newman will be the uh, guest, and uh, he is an Agenda 21 expert from the New American, and I could go on and on and on. But tonight we're with Clint Stutz of uh, TexasNullify.org. And, uh, Clint, um, I have all kinds of questions for you. And I'm going to uh, say good night from here, guys. Take it over. I see you got somebody in queue, and I'm going to say good night. God bless, and see you tomorrow night. And ciao from Bella, and thanks, you guys. And I'll talk to you later. Good night, Bella. Bye. Good night. So, Clint, um, some of the areas of Obamacare it's going to affect is uh, a sales tax, essentially, on property sales, um, any sort of capital gains. Um, but in a state like Texas, um, I mean, that's going to be millions of dollars if they're able to um, put into effect. Is it going to stop um, if your bill passes, what's going to happen to the real estate market? Is it going to be impacted here? Um, as far as the protection that a taxpayer would have, uh, yes, it would affect our real estate market. It, and something to point out about our plan, I mean, at least as it was turned in to the, uh, the Legislative Council, it was a voluntary thing. It, it didn't force – for example, if, if a Democrat in Texas want, wants to pay all, all his Obamacare taxes, he can go ahead and do so. We can't stop him. But anybody who does not want to pay any of their Obamacare taxes, whether it's the uh, uh, the individual mandate or if it's that sales tax on the sale of a home, uh, they can go through the Secretary of State's website and get protection that way and not have to pay that. So it would be an attractive thing in the Texas real estate market if a taxpayer could um, come here and, for example, if somebody from from uh, California, some big wig with you know, a multi-million dollar bank account comes to Texas and wants to flip houses. He would he would want to flip houses in Texas before he would flip houses anywhere else because we're interposing against that tax. And that tax is just something that adds to the price of that home. So that's going to impact that market that way. And there's other stuff that it would affect. Um, I think the medical device manufacturing gets like a, a certain percentage of a tax, and we could interpose against, we're going to interpose against that. Well, I'll tell you what else it's going to affect, education, because currently, um, you know, all of your student loans and Pell Grants and stuff is all being lumped underneath uh, the control of Obamacare. In fact, uh, I, on my student loan, was contacted the other day and was told, well, you've paid longer than X period of time. Once you reach this point, you can apply to have the rest of your loan voided. Well, who's going to finance in education, if they know that they're not going to be able to collect on that loan unless it's paid within, I think, 10 or 12 years. So, exactly. you know, we're going to have to deal with this in this state, and you're going to have to deal with this in other states, too, because you're not going to have educational systems that are going to be accepting, or you're not going to have institutions loaning money out knowing that they're not going to be able to collect after a certain period of time. We have a caller on the line. Would you like to take a call, Clint? Sure. 
Okay. Let's see. Hello. Hello, caller. You're live on the Bell D'Angelo show. Yes, my name is Stanley. I'm calling you all the way from New York. Um, I'm a person that voted for Obama, so I do believe that he's doing something that should have been done a long time ago. Uh, let's go back to history. No president, Republican, or Democrat before him did something with the health care, and that was an issue that should have been resolved a long time ago in my eyes because we're really in disgrace when it comes to that. I want to ask you a, question. a question. Yeah, I have a question to do with that. How can we have in the Constitution the right to live, but but how can you have the right to live if you have no health care? That's, that's uh, one of our rights. Right. Uh, it should be a right. Well, how it, can you it, have, it sounds like you don't understand what rights are. Well, do you, do you have a right to live, but you have no health care. So how can we function in a country like us that has Sam, the right to Sam, live but you have no health care? The rights are, are handed down from God, okay? You have a right to breathe because God both, uh, breathed life into you. He did not mm-hmm. give you the right to health care because, let's face it, he doesn't offer a health care uh, service. In fact, even who is uh, one of the biggest uh, complainants about Obamacare, it's the various churches, you know, being forced to adopt policies that go against their own beliefs. I mean, there is no right to health care. And as Ron Paul had said, at the point that you say you have a right to health care, then you have a right to force people to come in and provide services. You have a right to make people come in and clean the beds. And go. it goes on and on of all the, all the supported services that you have just forced people to do at a non-competitive wage because the government, in its almighty wisdom, says – it's a right. Yeah, Government does not hand down rights. Yeah, but so yeah. you had no problem when the insurance company are doing everything that you're saying, when Blue Shield, Blue, Blue Cross, Blue Shield is uh, the CEO of Blue Shield, Blue Cross is getting $1 billion, when a lot of insurance companies, you call them back and you're saying, I've been working a long time, and you're sorry, sir, we can't do that operation. It's not covered. You have no problem with that. You have no problem with precondition that a lot of companies are doing. You have no problem that some people... I have people no do. problem whatsoever with the and free market. That's a, that's a problem. That's a problem. I'm sorry. I, you know, I really don't see that as a problem uh, with the free market working. The problem is, and I think, Clint, you would probably um, agree or might want to uh, chime in on this, is when the government interferes with free market, you actually end up at that point, no longer having a free market. So then, yes, insurance companies uh, can exacerbate the issues. But let's face it. I mean, if if the government was out of our health care system, the insurance companies, yes, they're going to try to make a profit, but you're going to have a choice of whether or not you choose to purchase this particular plan or this particular plan, or Lord, Lord forbid, maybe become self-funded and save your money uh, in, in other ways, or you know, do some other creative ways to cover your um, your medical costs. Clint? Yeah, um, I think part of what people tend to gloss over is the fact that um, there are health insurance mandates, things that are required to go into a particular health care policy, uh, and different states have different mandates. So, for example, Texas is actually a mandate-heavy state. There's a lot of mandates that go into our health insurance policies in Texas, and those mandates actually drive up the cost of your coverage. So you've got 65-year-old women that are having to pay coverage for, um, say, in vitro fertilization uh, procedures in their policy, even though they're 65 years old and will have no use for it. And you've got well, you know, you multiple have. other mandates that have no application to the, the person being insured, but they're having to pay for that coverage. If we had a free market and we could actually build our own policy and say, I want to be covered for this, this, and this, but not this, we could tailor and bring down the cost of our own health care policies. Uh, but you know, what Clint, the caller was saw, talking about – go ahead. Clint, I saw this in, in Montana. Um, Montana is essentially priced at unisex. Um, so they pay some of the highest rates. So I have to offer when I offer insurance to my employees, I had to offer 
everything. And when I say everything, it's got to include uh, reproduction uh, coverage. It's got to include coverage for um, for uh, oh, um, oh gosh, uh, aut- uh, autism. You know that alone. When they passed the law in Montana, that raised the rates. Uh, up, I heard somewhere in the neighborhood of 26% for the average individual uh, insurance carrier. By the way, that last call was actually from Qu- Quebec. Uh, uh, you know, the caller is calling from Quebec, a country that uh, supports actually uh, having socialized medicine. And I have been in a hospital in uh, in uh, British Columbia and having had uh, insurance was rather interesting because I was not looking forward to being in their um, in their hospital. I had a gout attack many years ago, but the the emergency room was packed, and I got rushed right in. And I asked uh, the nurses, "Why why am I getting to go beyond all these other people?" And uh, um, the uh, essentially they said. Because you're American, you have insurance. Well, that's not going to happen here. So, Clint, um, if people want to start something like this, you know, where can they find out more information on how they can pick up a bill and adapt it to uh, to their state? Uh, as far as nullification is concerned, yes, uh, they could go to the Tenth Amendment Center dot com. They've got you know, basically the boilerplate bills they could look at and uh, use those as a starting point. Um, as far as getting involved in your own legislature and getting involved in your own process in your state, uh, most states do have a website for their legislatures. Texas happens to have a very good one. Uh, it's the Texas Legislature Online. I think that's the address. Hang on. Uh, actually, it's capital.state.tx.us, and we have a very, very transparent um, uh, Texas Legislature website, and you can look up bills, follow bills, you can you can watch committee testimony, you can watch um, House and Senate proceedings and video archives. Um, I would just encourage people to get involved in their state government. Um, it's my opinion that the federal government is completely lost. And if you, if you don't believe that yet, just, just keep watching the news. Um, we had this whole fiscal cliff thing going on, and I, I, w- I was only halfway paying attention during that time because I knew that they weren't going to do anything substantial, and of course they didn't. But they know that we have this fiscal cliff, we have this uh, this debt problem, yet they don't do anything about it ever. And they're going nuts over this sequester of the, these uh, sequester spending cuts when really it's not spending cuts it's growth it's cuts in the growth of spending so if you go from uh, like a 23% increase down to a 16% in- increase did you cut spending no you're still spending 16% more so if, if people just don't get it that Washington is completely lost and they really don't know what they're doing they need to get a clue and I think nullification is the one answer that we can have to restore constitutional um, principles in this country, state by state. But that has to take place at your state legislature, and it has to take place through you and the grassroots. You have to get it started, get the movement going, get uh, get, get the chatter going. Uh, call into radio shows and, and make a fuss about it. And call your state legislators and let them know that you support them, you know. Um, myself and Representative Derek Skies were often called the Nullification Brothers. Though, so, um, you know, up in Montana, um, it seemed like every other word out of our mouth was nullification. The press started to vilify us over that. And uh, you know, Derek's going to be on next week. Um, but um, you know, nullification is, as you said, the purest form of of implementing the Tenth Amendment. Uh, just like secession is nothing more than than essentially how our country was formed. We decided one day we've had it. We're seceding from uh, from England. I mean, there's some technical differences, but essentially th- that was how America was formed. So when you want to sit here and say nullification's illegal 
and uh, and that secession's illegal. Well, I guess people deciding they've had enough uh, from a tyrannical government uh, is illegal. Then we should probably become uh, subjects of England again. And if you re- if you don't agree with that, then great. If you don't believe in the Tenth Amendment, then you're in the wrong you're in the wrong country. Exactly. Yeah, tie this back into our three part segment that we're starting this um this week about the questions you're not supposed to ask in American history. We were talking earlier about um about the founding fathers and what they thought about immigration. And we were touching a little bit about Jefferson. Clint, did you know that Jefferson uh felt it was safer to wait patiently for natural increase of American population rather than to achieve such increase by mass immigration, essentially. I, I did not know that. He, he literally said that in his notes to Virginia. Um, and he was very much against any sort of mass immigration. There was several other uh, founding fathers and supporters thereafter who literally wanted some sort of check and balance for those that were coming here. Um You know, we picked the Founding Fathers. Uh, Let's see, get back to my part three notes. It's a new section for me. So clearly, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson had lots of reservations about mass immigration and what it would bring to changes in the culture, beliefs, and the government model of the current society. They'd witnessed this in other countries and throughout history, and history repeats itself. Alexander Hamilton uh, chimed in on this topic throughout the years, too. Hamilton took up the discussion of the American Indians and their immigration policy as the Indians extended nothing but friendship uh, as the colonists arrived. But he went on to say uh, that prudence requires us to trace the history further and ask what has become of the nation of savages who exercise this policy and who occupies the territory they once inhabited. He went on to say that the American Indians, in short, had a severe immigration policy. Now, that's politically correct, right? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, For Hamilton, immigration policy was a matter of prudence and good sense. In the infancy of the country, with boundless waste to the people, it was uh, politic to give a uh, facility to naturalization. But our uh, situation has changed. He literally witnessed that the population in just 10 years increased about a third due to immigration. And he really feared that if they did not uh, control immigration, the country that he knew would no longer be. Um, George Washington himself wrote to Adams in 1794, contending that the United States had no real reason to encourage immigration, quote, except of useful mechanics and some particular description of men or professions. So essentially, George Washington, who came, who came here and was the original founding father of our country, believed that unless you could come and be a citizen of good standing, offered a service or trade or profession that we needed, we really didn't need you. Many more of the, uh, of the founding fathers wrote similar thoughts regarding this immigration. Um, and though um, most favor the ability for someone to petition the United States to be accepted with open arms and coming in with a clean record or count, um, the, the reality is is that our educational system has been hijacked to give us a different thought about immigration. And none saw the United States uh, – None saw the United States as it was engraved upon the Statue of Liberty, and that is, give us your tired, your poor, your humbled masses, yearning to breathe free, the the wretched uh, refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. You know, so often I was taught, and I don't know about you, Clint, that that was kind of a paraphrase, our immigration policy, but... You know, we really need to remember that even though this is upon the Statue of Liberty, um, the Statue of Liberty was a gift by the French. You know, it was not representation of our immigration policy at all. 
So what does this really mean? If the founding fathers were not the welcoming fathers we'd all been taught in school, why? Well, I think um, we can kind of summarize this up with how we're witnessing the effects uh, of the migration of people who practice the Muslim faith. And, uh, you know, the Muslims have overrun parts of Europe and Canada and the world, once welcomed them as taxpaying people in overtaxed countries. So countries like France, which were taxing and overtaxing their people based upon the number of children, well, the French just stopped having children. And they essentially opened up their immigration to the Muslims and and people from other countries so they could build revenue. And what's happened is several countries have been forced to adopt Sharia law. Some have set aside their own religious roots as being less than the Muslim faith. You know, it doesn't take a blind man to see how immigration in our own country has placed the American culture second to that of the immigrant's lifestyle, chastising the native population as being, quote, politically incorrect. So with that, hopefully we can think about this. And next week we will be discussing in the 33-question section, uh, did Martin Luther King support affirmative action? So now uh, we're going to go back to our guest, Clint Stutz of the Texas Nullification of Obamacare Bill. Clint, so uh, yes, why don't we talk a little bit about how to effectively uh, form um, a group like you did? I mean, how did you use the tools out there to pull 14 uh, very diverse-minded people together across a state that literally could be the size of multiple countries and I think would be something like the fifth largest country in the world. How'd you do it? Well, um, of course, you know Deborah Medina and that she has what is called First Friday Dinner and Discussion at her house um, mm-hmm. every first Friday of the of the month. So uh, a pretty good portion of our people, the people that are active in the group, uh, came from there. You were one of them, um, mm-hmm. of course. And the rest of them, I think about half of the rest of them probably came from the organization that I was working with during the uh, the lead up to the Texas Repu- Republican uh, State Convention. And the rest of the folks that came on board besides them are people that they knew. So it's basically a networking type thing. Somebody knows somebody over here, and, and that person knows somebody over there, and they want to get involved, and it just kind of pulls together organically all by itself. Uh, it's really not something you can control as a person. Um, of course, you might see more enthusiasm in the beginning, and then you'll you'll finally get down to your core group that sticks around and wants to actually um, you know do all the heavy lift, heavy lifting. Um, so really, it's you know just you end up with a handful of people that are gung ho for it and want to want to follow through all the way, and the rest of the folks are there that probably can't devote the time like you can, or actually I can't devote the time either. I'm just doing it anyway. I just put <laughs> other things on the back burner. <laughs> like for example, I'm seven months behind on bookkeeping, but that's no big deal, right? But uh, you have a oh, lot no, of people no. that. Yeah, people play supporting roles. You know, they uh, they do the emails, they do the phone calls, they you know, stuff that doesn't take a whole lot of time. They can do in just a few minutes. But you get there, a lot of people involved. Of, Go ahead. There's a lot of free tools out there. I mean, one of the yeah. things you did, you created a um, Facebook um, page um, that would attract people who wanted to be involved in this. Um, and that was actually Teresa Beckmeyer's doing. Um, okay. Back during De- Deborah's campaign for governor, I did a similar thing. I came up with a thing called Medina Media Warriors, and what it was, she wasn't polling. She wasn't showing up in the polls. Nobody was asking about her. Nobody was um, wondering who this Deborah Medina person was. So we formed a group on Facebook, and a bunch of us that were you know, volunteers for the campaign said, okay, we're going to call radio talk shows and say, hey, get Deborah Medina on the show. And the first target was Mark Davis out of uh, Dallas on WBAP. And we targeted him for about a week. He said, okay, okay, leave me alone. Quit, email, quit emailing, quit calling. I'm going to get Deborah on the show. 
And once he had her on the show, other radio shows in Texas were lining up to get her on their show. So that's how that worked. And the funny thing is I didn't think of doing it for this group myself. It was Teresa that said, hey, I'm going to make a Facebook group and get all our people organized in there. It's like, well, duh, why didn't I think of that? I've done this before. But, you know, people like to – Teresa is super, super organized, and I guess my brain was just still fried from all the all the stuff I had done prior to the nullification thing. So she just, you know, hit the ground running with this, and in no time at all we got several hundred people in that group. That signed up to, uh, you know, to get signatures on petitions, to uh, spread the word, and all that good stuff. So, uh, it, well, like I said, this thing is so organic; it just takes off all by itself. And we also um, utilize other free tools that I, I just really kind of wanted to touch on. Um, we had to find a way to communicate, and you know, I'm sure other grassroots uh, people that, you know, regardless of the cause, want to, you know, know about. Some of these things. Uh, we used a. Uh, what was the calling service that you used? It's uh, freeconferencecall.com, and you can have I think up to 99 people on your conference call, and it's still free. And you can also during the call press a couple of buttons and record the call, and it's archived for you in WAV format and MP3 format. And so that way you can also share it. You can refer back to it. So people in your group that may not have been able to make the call but would like to know, you know, what they missed, uh, they can still be a part of uh, of that meeting. Um, yes. You know, so really just utilizing a lot of free tools out there, we pulled uh, a lot of people together that would have had no other way to really effectively meet regularly and um, go through you know, the bill in the manner they did. Um, and there's another thing. You've, you've mentioned our website a couple of times, texasnullification.org. That was a creation of one of our volunteers named uh, Greg Stessel. And mm -hmm. he just, on his own initiative, said, hey, why don't we get a website built? And and we were all on the, on the call, and we were like, yeah, that's a good idea, Greg. Why don't you do that? And um, Greg is he's – he's been very active in, in, in politics for many years, and his – standpoint is that you have to educate people and so you'll you'll go to our website and you'll see a lot of stuff that is education oriented about nullification because you're going to get people that visit the website that don't know anything about nullification and he wants to make sure that when you go there and you see our website you can find out everything you need to know about nullification um, and see Greg He's also got this other website called Smell the Freedom. Actually, let me type it in to make sure what it is. Yeah, smellthefreedom.org, and that is basically freedom for dummies. And I don't say that to be belittling, but people that have no idea what the Constitution means or what it's about or where it came from, they you can mean, go to like this our website. Say again? Kind of like our friend from Quebec that thought that it's a right uh, yeah, this guy North really needs to visit smellthefreedom.org to learn what rights actually are to begin with. Uh, it was obvious that your caller did not know what a right was, didn't know the definition of a right. Uh, but Greg does stuff like this, and I'm a big believer in education as well because dealing with politicians, and you know, we've got some good ones in Texas, but even the good ones can be ignorant on some of the, the more important issues. Um, you know, talking to you are – you're so right there. Um, I have an, another bill that Dwayne Stovall was working with me, and uh, we would talk to these various uh, senators and representatives, and God bless them. It was amazing how when you're explaining just simple concepts related to the Constitution, like how you know what the role of a senator is and how they were constitutionally uh, – appointed in their positions, and half the time, more than half, these people would look at you and say, really? You mean the people didn't yeah. just always vote for them? And, and it's like that on so much. I mean, and, and I mean no offense to any other legislators. Um, you know, they they do a lot of good work. They have a full plate, but um, and they can't be experts on, on everything. But, you know, it takes us as people – 
to take the effort and educate them, uh, educate them on that which they may not know. And I'm sure I've yet to meet a legislator ever who would say he knew everything. Um, yeah. They just can't. Now, just to give you an example of how bad it can be, even when you're talking to the most conservative state senator in Texas, I'm not going to give the name because I don't want to embarrass him because this is really embarrassing. We were talk- We were in the Capitol – for uh, I think it was January 8th when the when the session started, and I was with a guy named T.J. Fabby. He had run. Again, I was the one of his campaign volunteers. You know, worked real hard for his campaign. And T.J. Fabby knew this state senator personally and was a really big fan of his because he's such a good conservative. And so we said, well, let, let's take this bill to his office and see if we can get support in the Senate and just kind of get that going before we even get the House thing going. So I said, okay, let's go do that. We'll we'll have a talk with him. Well, he wasn't there. He was still in session, so we talked to his chief of staff and had a good conversation with him. But going out the door, we met the senator in the hallway, and T.J. was like, oh, hey. And they had a big greeting and hugged each other because they, they're pretty good friends. And T.J. says, I just want you to read our nullification bill. We, we'd really like, like to get your support. And the first words out of this senator's mouth was, well, you know, T.J., the word nullification isn't in the Constitution. Now, <laughs> at that point, the astute observer would say the, the good senator doesn't know his basic constitutional principles because the correct answer in response to that is, no, the word nullification is not in the Constitution, nor does it have to be because, number one, the federal Constitution – does not enumerate the powers of the states, does it? No, it doesn't. It enumerates the powers of the federal government. Now, if the states are not prohibited from doing nullification by the Constitution, that, that's one thing, and we are not prohibited from engaging in nullification because it's not mentioned there in uh, Article 1, Section 10, is it? No, it's not. But, you know, Clint, it's kind of funny. is most of the people that sit here – and want to really shy away from a bill that has nullification in it, and it doesn't even have to use that word. That's just the popular phrase of the day. Or uh, a bill that might deal with secession or conditions thereof um, tends to be uh, people that support the Federalist concept, that the Federal is the supreme government. And um, they really don't understand that the federal government was not a umbrella over all the states. The federal government was a light rope that we all held on to to make us look bigger, in a sense, uh, in the world. So we would fight together. We would share some common things that went through that rope. But at any time, any one of us could take our hand and just open our fingers and let that rope go. You know, yeah. that's that is the true power and limitation thereof. You know, you can tie someone up with a rope and that's what's happening, but the reality is is that rope was never supposed to be tied about around any one person or state's hands, but to be there just as a support to keep us together. Absolutely. And the, the sad thing is that the education – I mean, government schools are not going to give you an adequate – even an adequate introduction to the concept of liberty. Um, you get a cursory knowledge of the Constitution. You know what – you know the three branches of the government. That's pretty much it. But you don't yeah. really understand liberty. You don't really understand the Constitution when you come out of high school or even college. And no, I remember, that, my, I remember my civics course. You know what I remember it best about? We had this big book. Uh, it was the Constitution. It seemed like it was huge, but I remember far more is the blonde that sat next to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, uh, you're right. We are all distracted. Is, is so poor, and that translates into bad government because people that get bad education, they end up in government, and they have so little knowledge so little of what the required knowledge is. You know, it, it's sad that I have to go and educate my politicians on basic constitutional principles. 
it's sad that I have to do that, but I do, and and I'm going to do it some more in the coming weeks and months. But um, education, I think, is one of the most important things that we can engage in with our politicians and the people around us. People just don't know some of these basic things that are essential for us to safeguard our liberties. Well, the easiest way to steal uh, someone's liberty is to ensure that they d don't know their freedoms, don't uh, know their history, uh, that they yes. are essentially uneducated. And you know, um, Clint, you might not be aware of this, but there is all kinds of great tools out there um, and one that's about to come out is put together by Professor uh, Thomas Woods, and he's actually putting together a program that would be um, used for homeschooling or anyone that wanted to educate themselves. And he was going to have a K through 12th grade, and maybe it might go beyond, and cover a wide variety of topics. Topics and uh, there was talk. Don't hold me to this, uh, but there was talk that he was going to offer the K through five completely free. Now, when you can actually get someone of like Tom's caliber and the related uh, people that will be working on this project with him um, to put down in a medium that people can access worldwide on their own on their schedule. Um, you can actually begin to start to educate people or at least give them a choice of education that um, doesn't kill their pocketbook. And a lot of people choose not to homeschool because they feel, you know, well, I already am paying for a public education. But, you know, I really believe that if you're paying for an inferior product and you use it just because you're paying for it, well, I understand that we can't necessarily stop paying for it today. But um, why use an inferior product? I mean, you need to get yeah. the right product. And as a as a homeschool parent, I believe it's my responsibility to my children to ensure that they receive a true education. Absolutely. And uh, another part of the problem is some of the people that we look to um, as a quote unquote educator in some of these principles and, and some of these subjects, sometimes they would lead us astray. And one of those people, unfortunately, when it comes to nullification, is David Barton. And if you don't know, David Barton is the uh, the go-to historian for uh, for Glenn Beck. And I used to watch Glenn Beck a lot, and I've you know I've quit listening to him and quit watching him a long time ago. I just hate um, anything on TV. Basically, <laughs> I don't listen to him anymore, but. Uh, David, I mean, I, I thought he made some really good points on the Founding Fathers, and I enjoyed what he said. But in 2010, I think it was, he wrote a treatise against nullification, and it was absolutely god-awful horrible. It was basically a mishmash of quotes from Madison saying that he didn't uh, – supposedly didn't support nullification, that it was a bad thing. But what he was doing was he was taking – Madison out of context. He was leaving a big chunk, a huge chunk of Madison's writings on nullification out of the equation. And he was trying to make it look like these founding fathers did not support nullification. And furthermore, he made some erroneous conclusions about nullification in his, in his treatise. And unfortunately, David Barton is actually a constitutional advisor to a lot of our, or at least the a pretty good handful of our state representatives and state senators here in Texas. And when you've got someone like that advising these people, and then you have Joe, Joe Blow like me showing up saying, no, that guy's wrong, that just makes your hill that much more steeper to climb. Well, you're right, and I think um, irregardless of who, who you listen to, even me, I've had people sit here as a state representative and just – praise and kiss the ground I walk upon. And, and I have to turn around and say, you know, I'm not perfect. You know, I might have this concept down, but um, it's very easy to misinterpret or misunderstand things or perhaps just misapply. Just like when we were forming um, this bill idea together and both and you and we I... we were wrong, weren't we? We were wrong. We were wrong. And 
in freedom. Um, freedom is something that you need to always strive to understand the truth and strive to listen to others in trying to understand that truth. Um, you know, it's our egos that tend to uh, get in the way at times and uh, distract us. So, well, I really want to thank you for coming on the show tonight, uh, Glenn. Again, uh, Clint's website is texasnullification.org, or the Facebook site is Nullification of Obamacare. Yeah, thank you. Um, Let me go to it right quick. It I have is a Facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash nullify Obamacare TX. Okay, okay. So if you want to join the group, no more. And when do you when do you hope to that that bill will end up uh, being released out of uh, the legislative committee? Where I believe I it is actually, now, correct? I'm actually hoping this week. Um, and once that comes out, we'll be able to hit the ground running and really hit the publicity side of this. Uh, I would imagine when it comes out, it's going to you know gather its own publicity by itself. But we need to go ahead and kind of foment that some more. Call into the radio talk shows, write letters to the newspapers, and say, hey, look, look what's going on in Austin. We're, we're doing this in Texas, and we're leading the nation on this issue. And it, it's what our belief was that well, it, it could be. <laughs> We had in the 2011 session a state sovereignty committee, and that was the obvious place for this to go uh, this time around. But we don't have a state sovereignty committee this time. We have a um, uh, we've got a committee that's called federalism and something else. So it's basically a committee that they've thrown two things into, two subject areas into. Uh, I would imagine it would throw it would fall into either federalism. Or one of the health care committees. It's kind of up in the air. So, um, but regardless, whenever it does come out of uh, the uh, Texas Legislative Council and has a bill number, it's it's going to be uh, publicized quite heavily. And we're going to post it on the Facebook group. We're going to put it on our website, and we'll keep all the updates on there about its progress in the Texas Legislature this session. Okay, and of course, uh, I'm sure you'll be back on here if if not just for a few minutes to to talk about uh what people can do and they can always you know come back to the website belldeangelo.com um and uh there's links to Clint sites and the various groups and we will be uh keeping people apprised of this um also if you go to our website and sign up for the newsletter uh you'll be kept apprised um of not only this bill, but other bills uh, of the various people we've had on this on the show. Hey, Clint, I'd like to thank you for coming on, and please keep me apprised. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, start to wrap up the show. But thank you, Clint. Thank you very much, James. Have a good evening. All right, bye bye. So that ends it for uh, for Clint. I'd like to thank him again. Uh, it was such an honor to have him on. Yeah, you know, tomorrow. Uh,